here we are. I am going to officially um, start this conversation. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to um, the Art and Science of Facilitation virtual book tour. Um, and today with me, I have Marsha and Shannon and Mike. I'm going to um, do the official introductions right now. Um, but before I do, let me just tell you what this book is about, just in case um, you haven't picked it up or you, you are not 100% sure what this book is about. Um, so let me tell you, the Art and Science of Facilitation is your guide to moving your team further forward using the groundbreaking five guiding principles of the facilitation stance. For anyone ready to lead with self-awareness and group insight, this book is designed to help you navigate group dynamics so that your team can work more efficiently and effectively in a truly collaborative manner. So that is the book that we will be talking about today. So with us today, Marsha, author of the book, Marsha Acker, is a professional facilitator, executive, and team coach. She's the founder and CEO of Team Catapult. She uses systems thinking, structural dynamics, dialogue, and agility to help teams collaborate and align with clarity, purpose, and vision. Marsha is a facilitator of meaningful conversations, a host of dialogue, and a passionate agilist. Through her keynotes, books, workshop, and leadership coaching, she empowers people to grow their leadership range and show up authentically in their lives and work. Welcome, Marsha. Thank you. <laughs> so with Marsha today, we have two special guests. I'm going to introduce you to Shannon first. Shannon Ewan serves as Managing Director of the International Consortium for Agile, also known as IC Agile, an accreditation and certification body focused in the business agility learning space. Shannon has many years of experience as an Agile leader, um, coach, facilitator, and trainer across a variety of industries. In her current role, she enjoys working with thought leaders from all over the world to create comprehensive learning pathways to fuel organizational transformation. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you, Doreen. <laughs> okay, and last but not least, Mike uh, Holton is here. Mike Holton serves as the Director of Product Development at IC Agile. He has extensive experience in facilitation, team coaching, enterprise coaching, and leadership development. In his free time, Mike enjoys hiking, photography, and watching the most recent Disney movies with his children. <laughs> Welcome, Mike. Thanks. Uh, it's great to have everybody here. And I'm going to go through a few more household items in case you joined late. Um, we have a chat going. So if you have questions for the panel. We'd love for you to ask them in the Q&A. Um, towards, towards the end of the conversation, we're going to have time for our panelists to answer your questions, so make sure to put them right in the Q&A. Uh, we have technical support here today from Patty and Trish, so um, if you have trouble with the webinar or something goes on, um, you can go in the chat and, and ask questions there as well. Um, and uh, if you're interested in the book, the link has already been shared, but it's the Art and Science Facilitation book. Um, stay to the end. If you missed that announcement earlier, uh, we're giving away two signed copies of the Art and Science of Facilitation um, at the end. So you've got to stay to the end um, to do that. So um, let's get this conversation started. I'm really excited today to have this conversation. So the first question is an easy one. Um, and let's have Marsha go first. Can you give us your <laughs> personal description of a facilitator, Marsha? Mm. Oh, there's probably a longer, more um, concrete definition in the book, but I, um, I think about a facilitator as somebody who's creating space. Uh, and I, I think that means probably a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but I, I think facilitation is anybody at any any level of an organization, it can be inside an organization, it can be in your own home, <laughs> it can be in your volunteer uh, community, but it's somebody who's creating space for um, more powerful dynamic conversations. I love that you bring out that it's, it's for everybody, right? We're mm -hmm. all facilitators, you know, at work, at home, we're always facilitating stuff. You know, if I was going to build on your definition, you know, it's really about holding that space that allows the brilliance to come through mm. of those teams and groups of people. 
and, and allows them to bring out that creative side within them. And um, so I, I love what you're bringing there. Yeah. Well, yeah. and just to con- go ahead. No, go ahead, Shannon. And I'm going to go back to Mike. You go. Sure. I, w- I was just going to say, I-, I love the way in the beginning of the book, how Marsha kind of debunks what a lot of people think a facilitator is. So it's, mm-hmm. it's thinking it's much more about the coordination and the mechanics of it, when really it is about designing effective collaboration and not only being able to design it, but then in the moment being with the group to really work with what emerges in honor of their agenda. That's excellent. Mike, I wanted to just come back to you. We talked in the green room earlier about um, children and, and family life. And, you know, when we talk about facilitation, you know, that certainly would come in handy knowing and, and using those skills that you have as a facilitator in family life, correct? Oh, every day. Um, I mean, especially when it comes to like all of my kids went virtual with edu- you know education this last year. Mm-hmm. And just facilitating, you know, we have four kids. And so facilitating, you know, who's on Zoom? Does everyone have their, their electronics? And just allowing that ener- energetic flow to happen and the frustrations and allowing that to be, um, it's, uh, it's a life skill. More out, you know, I would say even sometimes more so in my, my home life than in my work life. Mm-hmm. That's excellent. Um, so thank you for that. So we have kind of what you each think a facilitator is. So let's move on to what does it mean to have uh, competency and why does it matter? Who wants to go first? Yeah, so I, I'm happy to kick it off. What I loved about the, what um, Marsha was bringing out in the book was it's, it's going beyond the, like the, sometimes what I call the technical competencies, like I've got my agenda and, and it's really about um, to me, having competency, it's really about the being, right? Can you be and hold the space for people? And I know when I started out in my journey, um, you know, in facilitation, for a long time, it was like, can I facilitate a meeting? Do I have the agenda? Can I get us through point A to point B? If there's conflict, we know to put, you know, put that in the parking lot. And as I, as I began to deepen my journey around what professional facilitation really is, It was really about my, it was all about me. It was about my ability and the inner work that I've done. Can I be and hold this space of conflict versus like, I hate conflict. It's uncomfortable. And so often (laughs) I would like rush through it. Like, oh, that's uncomfortable. Let's parking lot that. We'll talk about that later versus can I just stand in this conflict in the storm, um, you know, as Marsha talks about and, and be with this group so they can be in this conflict and get the richness and the wisdom that's here for them to learn. I think yeah, that I, was, I think go ahead, go ahead. No, just to add to that, also uh, kind of double clicking on the being, it really is that when we talk about competency, sure, you can learn the mechanics, the tools and techniques, the stances, but the only way to really master that being with the group is to do it and practice and build that muscle over time. So without putting in that time to really build the competency, you're not gonna be able to bring everything forward that you need to bring forward to be a strong facilitator. For sure. Yeah. I think about, so one of the ways um, that it was kind of behind, I guess maybe it was a little bit behind my intent of writing the book is I wanted a book that was not about facilitation tools. I felt like there was a lot out there that spoke to, I mean, you both are alluding to it in many ways. like. Uh, how to create the agenda and the parking lot and how to put things there was so there's lots of that and there's so many things that I think the agile space in general has in, in my opinion has in some ways really forwarded the profession of facilitation uh, a little bit more than even the the professional body of facilitators has done there's, so I think there's something that's happened in that space that's forwarded that um, awareness around facilitation but I wanted a book that would be with people whether they were just getting started or whether they had been doing it for a while. And I don't know, it could be that, that thing that you stick in your backpack and it's with you um, with like these, these reminders. I, so I've been doing it for years myself, but I don't, I'm not perfect at it by any stretch. So there's so many times where I'm like, ah, um, I'm noticing that my agenda is what's driving uh, this conversation right now. And so just getting aware of that and, um, and just, flipping it or changing my perspective and getting out of the space. So I wanted something that would, you know, competency, I think, is an ongoing process. I think building competency is, uh, it could be lifelong. 
um, I'm not sure that you're quite ever done with it, but I do think you um, you sort of a, a expand on it, you include what you've learned before, you uh, grow your ability to hold more complexity or hold more difficult conversations. Mike, I love what you're, you're talking about is the, this ability to, you know, be with conflict and my ability to be with conflict 10 years ago looks really different than my ability to be with conflict now. Um, and, and I probably have lots of space to grow there too. So I think it's a lifelong journey. That's great. And yeah, I think absolutely. we're going to come back to that conversation in a minute. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I was going to say, you know, I, I absolutely think it's a journey, right? And like we continue mm -hmm. to grow and transcend and then, you know, integrate. And, and, and what I love about the book is I think you're right. Like the, you know, I, I've spent a lot the last several years really developing coaching offices, you know, coaches mm -hmm. within organizations. And, and this book really speaks to, you know, wherever you're at in your journey, like you can pick it up. And if you're just starting out, it's a great place to jump into. If you've been facilitating for a while, it's a way to double click and really kind of take a look. And as you know, as I was thinking about, you know, my own journey, as I read the book, it was just, it was like, wow, like, I wish I had this, you know, a decade ago, right. And had this, like, there's so much sage wisdom in here and we all trip into, um, and, um, and it's so great. I mean, I love the part you talk about the three group agendas in your book. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, how many times <laughs> have I been in there where it's like, we've got the agenda, but then there's an actually underlying agenda that's emerging that it's like, yeah. that's actually what the team really wants to work on, but they didn't, mm -hmm. they can't, they weren't explicit about it. And so um, I just appreciated a lot of the sage wisdom that I think a mm -hmm. lot of us, you know, we've been in the trenches for a while and it's like, we all kind of know it, but we've never really, you know, probably put it into, on paper or verbalized it. That's great. So um, we're going to get back to that, um, that uh, competency journey at the end. Uh, uh, but let's move on to kind of alluded a little bit on that earlier. But what is the intersection between facilitation and leadership? If you can talk to that. The way I think of it when I think about agile leadership and, and the shifts that we try to make to become more agile in our leadership you can't really do that without some competency and facilitation and without truly st stepping into believing in the wisdom of the group and believing that the group has its own answer. Um, so it's just hard to conceive of somebody being able to really grow in their agile leadership without developing this capability and just truly being able to create containers to develop others. I also think like, just to add to that, like facilitation is a role that leaders often have to step into. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, you know, we often talk about professional coaching as well, right? You know, leaders don't need to be a professional coach or a professional facilita facilitator, but they need those competencies and those skills because often as a leader, we are facilitating this group, right? We, you know, sometimes it's directly, we've got a group of, you know, whether it's executives or team, sometimes we're just facilitating a system right? At that meta level. Um, I think, you know, and then I think from the facilitation point of view, often as facilitators, we are leaders, you know, we're leading from behind in that space. We're not necessarily the ones that are leading from front, making the decisions, but we're leading from behind and creating that space mm -hmm. that allows other people to lead um, from the front or for in different aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my, when you just said that, it, it, it reminded me of the part in the book where um, Marsh is really talking about getting to know your own style and, and, be, and how that impacts how you show up in the room. And I think both yeah. that skill is paramount for both leadership and facilitation. Mm -hmm. So it really is uh, um, just, there's, there's tremendous overlap there in a positive way. I yeah. Think. yeah, I think that <clears throat> there's, a, there's something about, um, I think both of you are, are highlighting it. It's, the, it's this ability to, it, to have range in your leadership, you know, to be able to, to take a step back. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's some traditional older uh, mental models around leadership that would have the leader of a meeting or, you know, whoever's kind of in charge of that particular conversation to be the one sort of setting direction and actually 
making the moves that says, you know, here's what we're going to do. Here's the here's the decision that we're going to put forward. And I think it's not that you you don't you won't have moments where somebody will step forward and say, here's here's the direction we're going. But I think leadership today uh, that assumes that there's one person who can come up with an answer to a particular um, problem or um, issue that's on the table. And I think today we operate in environments where just the sheer magnitude of the issues and challenges that we're trying to solve, the complexity, it just takes more than one person thinking. So I think to do like to hear other voices requires leaders in all levels to just get back out of the way in a different way. So. And I love that you're bringing that because there's so much that emerges today. Like if I think about when I, you know, 20 years ago when I had my, probably my first formal management role, mm -hmm. um, like I could, you know, I, I could be that kind of, you know, type A leader. I knew everything was going on. I mean, sure the stock market crashed, but you know, for the most part, like, you know, things kind of just built on each other, but you know, without, without having that skill of facilitation as a leader, we can't really harness the wisdom of the whole. And you often reference that in your book. It's like, how do yeah. we get that genius and that wisdom? Because honestly, it's like one person just can't consume as much data or information or have a sense of what's going on and emerging in the world today mm. with that complexity. Yeah, yeah for sure. So um, thank you for that, all of you. That was, that was great. So can, can you discuss how I see Agile sees the difference between facilitation and coaching? What do you see going forward? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things I said earlier as we were chatting is, is really, we, we believe the, the way we look at our journey, the Agile coaching journey and the team coaching journey is all coaches really need to be facilitators. They need to have that capability. Um, all facilitators don't necessarily need to be coaches. So you can apply the discipline of facilitation in many different areas um, across our curricula. And so, but we do really believe that, um, you know, when we integrate other stances of professional coaching, mentoring, teaching, really starting out with strong facilitation and how, and, and how, and seeing how that helps with team development is, is paramount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would, you know, to build on, I think, you know, in addition to kind of bringing those competencies together, um, it's, it's, I think also where, where I would say facilitation is we're going to probably see is emerging is more systemic. It's like, how do we actually facilitate, you know, especially when we're talking about business agility and we've got, you know, these different organizational structures within a large company, um, how do we facilitate across these, these systems mm -hmm. and, and, you know, moving beyond just, Hey, I'm facilitating a team or I'm facilitating, um, you know, uh, this group of people or I'm facilitating, a, you know, a, like, let's say a, an open space or some kind of large meeting, but it's like, how do we actually facilitate at a meta level and really kind of step back and like, how are we facilitating the flow of between these different parts of the organization in a way that we probably haven't experienced when we um, tackled scaling Agile uh, many years ago. I think there's something new that will merge there. And I think the the Agile world, um, and, and Marsh has had a huge impact on this, it really has come to embrace the power of facilitation a lot more than, mm -hmm. than, um, than before, uh, definitely than say 10, 15 years ago. And I also see just with the pandemic and the move to remote work, everyone really noticing that difference <laughs> and, and what it does to go, what <laughs> the impact of going remote and what that does to communication and collaboration. Um, and it really amplifies the sort of negative impacts of facilitation done poorly. So I think there is tremendous opportunity yeah. for the world at large coming up here. Yeah, it's funny, we, we kind of, oh, sorry, go ahead, Marcia. I was just gonna say, I was, um, it, you made me think of something, Shannon, because I, I, I mean, I, we've experienced it, I know you all have too, the, the world has, we're in this great big social experiment of, you know, how do we all work remotely at the same time? And I, I, I hear and read all the things about we're fatigued, you know, it's really hard to collaborate. I've met with teams who actually haven't seen their um, team members since April or May. I mean, literally haven't seen them because they haven't been using cameras. They've just been meeting online or meeting in a Google Doc or something. And so I'm, I have begun to think, I think there's something about the virtual space that is, I, our meeting dysfunctions have been there for a really long time, but I think this 
2020 has a bit, it's like shown the spotlight on how kind of crippling some of our, our meeting dysfunction can, can be and look like. So. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because I, I hadn't really thought about that, but it is true. Like um, sometimes when I have the opportunity to facilitate like with a group, like nobody's cameras on and like, I'll show yeah. up and, like I have my camera on, like, don't we all want to turn our cameras on to like, you know, see each other and connect and, and so it, you know, it really, I love that you're bringing that because it, 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 mm. it has highlighted our dysfunctions. Mm. Um, I think also, you know, if I was going to add to that, like, I've seen so much amazing work come out, like, for a long time in the agile space, it was, it was sacred. We always meet in person. We don't do virtual. <laughs> like, it was kind of like a, a bad taboo for us. And it's been so beautiful to watch how so many agiles have pivoted and gone to this remote facilitation. Mm. And showing up in that space around like, wow, like I'm really met, I'm, I'm received. And they've really put a lot of effort and energy to, you know, have a similar experience, although it's online, but, you know, yeah. we're still face to face, we're still in person, we get to still see each other. And, and they have a clear you know, understanding of their stance. Yeah. I, Mike, I, I, I share that perspective. Like, I really do believe that we can be connected virtually. Um, but it does require different things, just like it would in the room. But I think we... I think we just, I'm, I'm generalizing, but I think in mm -hmm. the day-to-day face-to-face meetings, we just don't think about it as much as I think it's been, it's like the spotlight's been on it and people are feeling disconnected and they don't feel like uh, they're, qu they're getting quite as much meaning. And I do believe that you can create that in the virtual world. It just takes a little bit more intention and it takes how you show up in that conversation. So, Yeah. And, and, you know, like I was reading an article, I think Deloitte published it talking about like the number one, um, I think it was like the number one hope that leaders want is, is how do we create a sense of belonging? Mm -hmm. And I think, if, you know, if I think about in, you know, 2021, what can we do as Agilists is really facilitate belonging in these organizational communities? Because, I mean, I haven't been in an office for a long time. And like, there was something around like going to an office, getting a glass of water, you know, having that water cooler conversation mm -hmm. and connecting with people yeah. Those hallway things that was elevators, just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Elevator. you kind of take it for granted, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, how do we, you know, as agilists, how do we create that belonging that is needed in organizations yeah. that we all want to be a part of, um, but remotely? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Great. And and while we're on that subject, I want to make sure that everybody that's come into the conversation um, a little bit later, we've got um, lots of people here watching this conversation. There are some good questions already asked. So if you have questions for the panelists, make sure that you put them in the Q&A um, at about uh, 1245 Eastern time. Uh, we'll go ahead and ask some of those questions um, to our panelists. So if you have questions, please do so. I want to make sure I recognize all of you here. And then as a follow-up on this on this conversation about what happened in 2020 and what you saw happening with virtual, um, what, do you, what trends have you uh, seen in demand for facilitation versus coaching coming out of this, coming out of 2020? And, and why do you think that happened? Mm -hmm. I, 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 oh, oh, go ahead, Mike, Jim. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, I, I definitely, um, as I alluded to earlier, there was a major spike in um, desire to learn how do we collaborate remotely. Uh, and, and that, to me, it, it does involve coaching and remote agile coaching um, comes up in conversation a lot as well. But there, there's just that strong push to how do we even get and kind of talk, um, thinking about the model in the book about the basic and developmental facilitation. How do we really even get that basic facilitation capability going remotely? Yeah, I think um, to build on that, you know, it's um, I think there was a long, a big desire on how do we design it? Like, how do we have that basic facilitation and how do we design for remote? in a way that like we're used to like getting into a room, having our sticky notes, you know, setting the, you know, depending on how you do it, maybe, you know, and Marsha, you talk about this, you know, setting a circle of chairs, right? Let's get mm -hmm. rid of the, the obstruction <laughs> of the tables, right? And let's just make us all neutral, which is so brilliant. I love, I love that move. Um, mm -hmm. And, but how do we actually design that in a way that, mm -hmm. you know, how do we have a circle of chairs virtually? Mm -hmm. um, and now it's, you know, Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams or whatever you're, you're, you know, it's now we're boxes and we're kind yeah. of Brady Bunch, but how do we have that, that container in that space? 
Yeah. And I think another trend we saw was the the dispelling of the myth that you can't have good coaching um, training or coaching conversations Mm. virtually. So I think that was a story that people had been telling themselves for a while. And when we were working with a lot of our member organizations to design their coaching classes for remote delivery, uh, we saw a lot of feedback coming in at just how rich an experience that was for the participants, especially given the that disengagement they were feeling in other areas of their lives because of the pandemic. It really, they were really able to have a connected, uh, very powerful experience in coaching. Yeah. You, um, Shannon, you're making me, so I definitely would put myself in that category of we've, you know, we've led um, online programs prior to 2020, but I definitely was in the space of, I was just, I wasn't sure that I really wanted to teach coaching in a remote space. Like I, mm-hmm. I just, I loved being in the room. I, I think it's impactful. Uh, the experience of being there for three days or five days just has, it just has a different feel or quality to it. So I think the, one of the takeaways for me this year has been, um, I, I love that there was a set of conditions that uh, allowed us to create it. And there's so many things, it's different, but I do think you can create connection. I think it can be meaningful, it can be impactful. And I love the geographical diversity that it brings. So there's something about like crossing cultures, crossing geographies, and I, we just, it's hard to have that kind of diversity in a in-room you know, in the room type of course, because it just costs a lot for everybody to make that kind of trip. So there's some things about it that I'm really appreciating. And I love that you're bringing that because I've heard that too. And I've seen that it's like, it's, it's bringing people together from Europe and from, you know, Africa or Asia and and Mm -hmm. North America and South America. And and, in what world do you ever really get that? It's very rare that I've ever been in a workshop that I've had like a lot of, you know, it's only like the senior leadership stuff that you see that, but it's, it's been su- such a blessing to see those perspectives um, in that geography and in those world, those world connections where it kind of all helps us see that we're all kind of one in one world versus, you know, yeah. you know, North America versus Europe or whoever. Yeah. I'm curious. So from a IC Agile perspective, Shannon, you and I have talked previously about, um, I, you know, I think trends maybe pre 2020 were, mm-hmm. you know, more demand for coaching, less for facilitation. Cause it's, I, I, my story is it's just not as sexy uh, or there are not as many um, job titles that equate to yeah. the facilitation as there is for agile coaching. So I'm curious from that lens, have you seen, has IC Agile seen anything different? Uh, we definitely have, I think in one sense, in terms of getting into larger group facilitation and more enterprise facilitation, but I also think as we're building out uh, more content around leadership, when we really think about the term, you know, team facilitation, as opposed to, uh, you see that show up in the scrum framework as the scrum master. But if you think about those two terms and what you're really trying to do with the team, the resonance of the team facilitation is is definitely increasing. And I think we're also seeing, um, because the the Agile coaching track has been successful and popular uh, for a number of years now, we're seeing a lot more interest in um, team coaching, teams as human systems, and then also the enterprise, the, the growth and demand for the enterprise coaching for agility is very significant. And that involves the ability to facilitate really at that large group level and spanning boundaries, et cetera. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's true that we are still, you know, working with, with folks who are newer to the Agile world, really unpacking those terms and, and what it means. But I believe we're making, uh, making good progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting, um, like, so you know, I've only been with IC Agile for a little bit, but before that, a lot of what I saw was in 2019, there was a huge, there was a, even more of an, a, a, like a surge around people, Agilists getting professional coach training. Mm-hmm. That almost immediately stopped when, when, and you know, March of last year, and it was what I saw in organizations. What they were, what they were, my my clients were pulling was they were like, how do we have remote facilitation? They were double clicking into, you know, the you know, at an agile facilitator class, and with specifically, how do we do this remotely? Because, yeah. you know, they just we. I think you're right. Like there is a sexiness to professional coaching. Um, and there's a pr- maybe, you know, facilitation can sometimes come off as practical, but yeah. man, we have pivoted. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of clients I saw in, in 2020 were really focused on 
How do we have better quality facilitation in a way that I don't think I've seen in years prior? Yeah. Yeah, and my hope is that with this book, it's it's going to Mm -hmm. keep that tide rising uh, in terms of facilitation. It's one of the things I loved about the structure of it was, um, you know, at one point, uh, Marsha talked about how facilitation is one of those things that when it's done well, it's magical, but people might not make the connection that it's because of strong facilitation. If it's done poorly, though, (laughs) people sense it. And, um, and that can feel amorphous to people when you're trying to make the case for facilitation. But what you did, Marsha, it really explained like, this is what shows up when you are neutral. This is what shows up when you're not neutral. This is what shows up. So really giving some concreteness to those being aspects of facilitation that I think um, are, my hope is that that will go a long way towards yeah. making the case too. I, I share your hope. <laughs> I do, because I do think that that's, I think with leaders in general, there is there is this mm-hmm. uh, bias potentially that just says, I've, "Why would I need to learn how to how to facilitate a meeting?" I I do that all the time, um, and I think it is it is one of those. Uh, it's like a stealth skill. Like if you you'll know mm-hmm. it if you've been in the room, but you likely, unless you've got a trained eye, might not be able to pick out what exactly was somebody doing that that had it be a good conversation that actually Mm -hmm. got all voices in the room. We felt like we were heard or understood. I don't, I don't think that it's always evident um, or it just feels like that would be super easy. You know, anybody could do that. So I hope, I hope that, you know, with the more we're able to talk about it and talk about it as a craft, uh, a competency, like it's, it's a place that, um, like to do work and, and do your own development around it, that it that that will potentially change the nature of conversations. That's great. I just want to remind everybody, um, if you have questions, we have some great questions come in. So I'm gonna, in about 15 minutes, I'll start asking the panelists. Um, if your answer, the, if your question does not get answered today, we will make sure it will get answered. We will be sending out an email to everybody that was here today <laughs> with the answers to your questions, but we're gonna to try to answer some of them live. Um, Marsha, this might be a good time for you to read um, a little uh, part from your book for everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd be glad to. So um, we titled this uh, stop in the book tour as Beyond Facilitation, which is a little bit of what we've been talking about, but it, you know, it's not just that. But there's a, the last chapter is called Beyond Facilitation, and I just thought I'd read um, a clip from that. So uh, for those of you in the Agile environment, this book offers a way of being Agile that goes beyond the basics of Agile values, principles, and practices. It's designed to help you focus on what you will bring as a leader and how you show up in your work. And this is the difference between doing Agile versus being Agile. Agility will come by our ability to be in deeper dialogue about what's happening and what's needed in the product, the team, and the organization. Our collective ability to have dialogue will come with greater awareness and some support in getting there. So in other words, agility might come from practices, but without dialogue and collaboration, it won't be true agility. If nothing else, this book stands for two simple ideas. When you are facilitating, collaboration begins with you and you must manage yourself. And yet ultimately it's not about you at all. That's the twist. Facilitation begins with you, but it's about taking yourself and your ego out of the equation in order to be in service to a greater cause. It's about finding collective wisdom, talking about what really matters and bringing the conversation into the room. That's great. So the question that um, comes from that is so you read what's you know you read about beyond facilitation so it's important to get that competency right mm-hmm. um, and and not doing agile but being agile so I would love to know what is hard about developing that competency of facilitation is there anything that's that's is it just a matter of doing it or is there something else there that makes it harder I think one of the, at least in, when I think about my journey, it's really opening yourself up to getting a lot of feedback and for the, um, you know, for the benefit of growing your facilitation so that you can be in service of teams and groups. And I think that mental shift, um, people understand when you say maintain neutrality, they understand that concept, 
but when you actually are in there and, and self-managing it, it's that that is a big hurdle for a lot of people and I think mm -hmm. um some of those early shifts when, when you start to really understand it's it doesn't come naturally um so I I do think it takes some hard work and and the irony is when it's done well it looks really easy mm -hmm. If I was going to build on that, I think, you know, it's, for me, it was, um, it's, it was making the unconscious conscious. Um, and, and like, like, you know, when I would start, it's like, oh yeah, I'm neutral, but I have such a strong positivity bias. And so I would always come into and facilitate. I'm happy and I'm perky. And like, <laughs> somebody would say something so terrible. I'm like, oh, that's great. Or I love it. <laughs> and, but that was who I was. And so it was a really kind of a hard lesson around seeing wh how I really showed up. And I couldn't, I couldn't see it for a while. I really needed a coach to help me see that, to really help me see like, here's how I was showing up. This is, here's the impact I'm having in the room. And, and it was, it was a big pivot. It was a lot of inner work to like mm. not show up to be like hyper perky or, not be able to be in the uncomfortable and it's still ongoing it's it's mm. never ending yep we still want to see more cynicism out of mike no i'm just <laughs> i'm working on it <laughs> i think you know um i think i think competency i think growing the competency will will be different for everybody but mike mm -hmm. you said something earlier about uh, for you it was around conflict that was that was probably some of my greatest work to do as well this this notion of um like if conflict emerges to stay with it rather than run away from it i mean i was i was yeah i felt like i had perfected the art of um <laughs> managing conflict out of my sessions because i know what to do if it emerged so i certainly didn't want to create space for it and um it really is shifting and understanding my own understanding of uh, conflict actually is needed. Like, and it it's the thing that we'll grow from. And it, and when it's not here, we're potentially not talking about the real thing, or we're just staying at the surface. And so, the ability to um, I think expand your willingness to be there, so that when when the mm -hmm. The thing, <laughs> the, the shot across the bow, or whatever it might look like in that conversation, gets gets lobbed. That you don't. It's not the time for a coffee break. It's actually the time to stay with it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that'll look like, it'll look different for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what you you know, this this notion of being in service to other people. It's it it's the the harder part is just doing the work. Um, like, are you willing to do the work? Does it make sense? Are you, um, Shannon, you talked about getting feedback. I think the other place that I've grown is um, I, I get feedback, but it doesn't always mean I'm acting on it. So just because a session uh, didn't feel great for people doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't what they needed to have. Um, so, so I think also uh, finding center, finding your own ground to know, like why you're doing what you're doing in the room. And I, and I love that, like after we do all that work, it's really in service and like what you said, it's to get out of the way, Yeah. right? It's, it's allowing us to be with what's there in a mm. way that we can come across being neutral and allowing other people to go through the journey that we've been in, um, in service of, of, you know, what their, their goals and objectives are and agenda yeah. is. And it's hard. It's mm -hmm. not easy. It's <laughs> hard work. I think you have to want to do it. Like it's got to be yeah. like, you've got to find your own why about um, like, mm -hmm. why, why would I, why would I do this uh, for the purpose of what? Cause if it's just box checking it, it likely won't, um, it'll have a different feel to it. So. Yeah. We're going to have, I have two more questions for the panel and then we're going to move into the Q and A. Just want to remind everybody that's here live. Put your questions in the Q and A. If we don't answer them live today, we will get out an email to you with the answers to your questions. So go ahead and put them in there. Um, and for the panel, we're here to celebrate this book, right? The Art and Science of Facilitation that Marsha just wrote um, about the book. If you have one thing that surprised you when you were reading it, I would love to, we would love to know what surprised you about it. I, you know, I think the thing that surprised me the most is I've read so many facilitation books and we kind of already talked about this. It was always about the mechanics of facilitation. And what surprised me was like, finally, there's a book that's talking about the stuff that I 
feel like most of us struggle with, which is the being of facilitation. And I think just that core concept, because so often I'm like, I see people, they're like, hey, well, give me some feedback about your facilitation. And it was, it's all mechanical. It's like, you know, your sticky notes, were they straight or whatever? And, and like, what surprised me was, wow, there's finally a voice around what I think is, is we don't have a loud enough voice around how do we actually become versus and be versus just do. Yeah, and um, Doreen, when you asked that, what's coming up for me is, is there were some things that didn't surprise me, and that was just the clarity, the structure, the, the, the value of it, the usefulness of the toolkits and the way things were, were framed. Um, and I was just reflecting on that because I've known Marsha now for, I think, almost nine years, yeah. and <laughs> she just brings forth that in such a wonderful professional way. And so I was seeing that come together in that way um, was was nice. It was really nice to read and see. And I think maybe conceptually, one of the things that was in there that I was pleasantly surprised by was really that discussion of polarities and dispelling the myths of you can't be both effective and collabor or efficient and collaborative. And you know, really getting people to challenge how they think about things and get clear with with their own stance. So, yeah. You know. That's great. So um, you you alluded to this earlier, Shannon, but the last question is about your own journey of uh, competency, uh, you know, in agile, in facilitation. Uh, what structure do you recommend um, for somebody that just at the beginning of this journey of leadership, facilitation, agile, um, you know, reflecting on how you learned. What if, if you have any advice? Because there might be people watching today who are new to this space, um, who've come here to learn more about facilitation because there's conflict in their teams, or um, somebody invited them in. Where, where can somebody start? I guess one thing, and, and um, I think one of the dysfunctions that we see is when people start and they focus and fixate on process and practice and framework and less on the principles and the values. And, um, you know, it came out a couple of times in the book about, you know, there is no one recipe for agility. Agility in action or agility done well can take a lot of different forms. And so I think it's that sense of, of really thinking about kind of why, what is, what is the ultimate goal that you want to achieve by developing your agile capabilities and always anchoring that back to that that why and the what, as opposed to really getting mired down in the techniques and the and the tools and the practices. Um, I like to dive in on things, so my recommendation is just dive off the dock and get involved. And mm -hmm. you know, and um, I think I, my agile career started with volunteering, and volunteer if you don't have the opportunity at work to facilitate. Um, join an agile meetup group and learn to facilitate, just get, get immersed and get doing the work. And then, you know, have your retrospective pause. Like how, how did I show up? What, what was here? Um, just, but get involved, dive in. Um, you're going to make a thousand mistakes. Um, I think anybody that's been doing it for a long time, that's a great facilitator. It's like, I make mistakes every day. <laughs> every time I facilitate, I show up and like, did I really just do that? Mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. that's what I would say is just mm -hmm. just go just get involved yes yeah it's like spoiler alert you know you will make mistakes right <laughs> so, so don't yeah. let the fear yeah. of making mistakes stop you from going yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. a lot of mistakes yeah. <laughs> it's not a question of whether it's just when <laughs> and how much <laughs> mm -hmm. and what you can learn from them exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. oh Serene you're on mute All right, so I must have done that by mistake. Sorry about that. Um, I think we're ready to move into the Q&A. We have quite a few questions. Um, and I just wanna remind everybody that's here right now, again, if your question's not answered, um, we will send out an email. Stay to the end. We're giving away 
um, two signed copies of the Art and Science of Facilitation in about 10 minutes, so stay for the Q&A. Um, and um, to the panelists, uh, these questions have come from people who are watching. They're wonderful questions. I'm gonna give each of you like maybe a minute. If you don't wanna answer, it's fine. If you wanna take two minutes and we'll move on to the next one. Let's try to um, maybe answer four questions or so. We have about 10 minutes. Um, so that would be great. So Mary is asking, um, do you spend time making sure that people um, in the meeting know what their role is? For example, development manager in Team Scrum, um, you know, what do you think? I, my short answer is yes. I think I think role clarity is super important for people. Some Some people will be asked to full on collaborate. Others might be um, providing expertise in a particular area. So I think it's really helpful. I don't know, I'm curious if you'd say anything different. Yeah, I would say yes, but it depends. Um, I think if we're looking to make a decision, definitely role clarity, who's responsible for making the decision? Is it a team decision? Are you influencing the decision? And so I think, you know, in the past, I have some protocols that we might use based off mm -hmm. of like, what's your role in this decision-making process? Um, and then other times, um, not so much. Um, and we, we, I just let those roles emerge and then maybe name it. Like, here's what I'm seeing. And so I think it just, it depends on what I'm, what the, the purpose of the meeting might be mm. that I'm facilitating. That's great. Great. Um, the next question is for Marsha. Um, Marsha, Omar is saying um, he hasn't had a chance to read the book, but do you talk about creating um, um, psychological safety when facilitating? Uh, it's a great question. It, certainly there are aspects. Uh, I'm, I don't think I used that phrase uh, very specifically in the book, but there's lots of aspects of um, the, that part of being a facilitator and how you show up that I believe contribute directly to psychological safety and um, the underpinnings of what, you know, what it looks like to create that kind of space. So yeah, aspects of it. All right, the next question is for everybody. If you want to answer, that's great. Um, the question comes from Michael. Um, he asks, if becoming a facilitator is an ever-growing confidence journey, how would you recognize a professional facilitator? What are the identifiers this person would have? Hmm. Uh, I don't know if I would say like, here's a checklist, um, but my gut, uh, when they, it's how they show up. It's like, you can tell if somebody's done the work and the way that they're showing up in front of the group to know if they have the skill around professional facilitation. There probably is a checklist. I just haven't ever mm. thought of one. <laughs> I think that's true for me too. I mean, it, like if uh, you could check out the International Association of Facilitators, they have a a competency definition and a certification based on that. I, I see Agile um, and the facilitation track. There's, uh, we do distinguish, I think, in the track, the difference between like competencies of facilitation, mm -hmm. like what competent looks like, you know, coaching a team. And those are, that's a Venn diagram, a subset of professional facilitation. But I, I think it's about, it's about how much the group is able to accomplish. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's your ability as a facilitator to self-manage and be also group, you know, self-aware and group aware um, and, and balancing back and forth between those two. Mm -hmm. And balancing that preparation with being in the moment, because I, yeah. I think <laughs> you can, you can master, you can be very detail oriented and meticulous about design and, and bring some really great um, design in, but if you're not experienced enough or present enough to really be there in the moment, to me, that would flag, you know, this person is, is maybe not quite to that competent or professional level. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That, that was great. Uh, the next question is, um, <laughs> can you talk a little bit more about the importance of visual communication, encouraging your team to put their camera on? <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about this. I, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I, um, I just, I actually just wrote an article that uh, how mute and the um, our video button are killing uh, virtual collaboration. Like I, I think that our ability to you know, the things that we've been talking about today, I think it relies, in my opinion, it relies really heavily on our ability to turn our cameras on, uh, actually be off mute and on camera and. 
um, let the natural flow of the conversation emerge. So you hear people cough or you sneeze. You'd, you'd be hearing it in the room. Uh, mm -hmm. When somebody tells a joke, I, just exactly what you just did, Shannon, you know, that mm -hmm, like our, you know, our brains seek that uh, acknowledgement in lots of different ways. And so I think that's one of the things that creates a little bit of this, this disconnected black void that some people yeah. feel like they're living in right now. So mm -hmm. I, my opinion. I also it's, think it's, to maybe okay. bring a little bit of cynicism to the answer is it, in these days, if, if people aren't on camera, the odds that they're engaged in the conversation are quite low. And, and, I, and I feel like just recently mm -hmm. seeing friends and family on meetings and in work context, it's, it's, they'll be off video and they're doing something completely different and then they're on video when they need to speak, you know? And so I think in terms yeah. of having true collaboration, um, and that's that. That really is a missed opportunity because you you're missing out on the opportunity for that shared understanding that actually ends up saving you so much time um, and effort in the long run if you're able to connect. Yeah. I think it also points to how are we in relationship with each other, mm. and and you know Cindy Adams with the Leadership Circle profile um, or Full Circle Group, she said you know it's only in relationship um, do we really grow. And if, and if I'm just off camera, we're all off camera doing something else, like we're not really growing together. We're not growing as an, as a team, as an organization. And so it, um, we miss something and we miss that ability to belong together yeah. to create something more. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, this next question from Michael, um, also goes to you, Marsha, um, what sources of information and knowledge have you tapped into to develop your book? Mm. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I said this in the acknowledgements uh, and genuinely meant it. I, you know, if anybody that I have worked with over the last 20 years of my career, there's so many, I can trace back, you know, my lineage and my thinking to so many people that have, um, like informed or helped me push and pull on my model of, you know, how I think about facilitation and my own learning, my coach training, my own facilitation training many years ago, um, just, uh, just all of it. Uh, and then there's also references um, that are in the book around, uh, I think some real thought leaders in the space professional facilitation. So Roger Schwartz is a, is a big one for me. He's written many books, Sam Kaner, um, the facilitator's guide to participatory decision making, I think, is a also kind of a. If I think about what sits underneath of my thinking, kind of the groundwork there, I came through coach training with CTI and ORSC, and so there's there's definitely aspects of that. I'd say the there's a way that the facilitation book talks about facilitation with a very coach like lens to it, um, and in this notion of holding space and that kind of thing. So. That and then a lot of my um, uh, probably newer thinking is comes from the space of structural dynamics by David Cantor and the the ability to look at systems and the the conversational patterns and our ability to um, help teams bring all of those in. So the list is long, but <laughs> and and I've you know so many colleagues that I've worked with that I've partnered with and have been here at Team Catapult or even in our um, clients. So lots. That's great. That was that was a great question. I, I really like that. So we have time for one more question and then uh, we're going to announce the winners of the two signed copies of the Art and Science of Facilitation. Um, this question I think is for everybody. Any mm. ideas on manager as facilitator, how to get the group to buy in? Often the group can see the facilitator because the person is the manager. Um, any thoughts on this for either mm. of you? Mm. That's a tough one. I, I think um, I think it can work. The dynamics have to be there though. Um, and it, I feel like if a team falls into a pattern where the manager is always facilitating, you're gonna get that same kind of dynamic where it is a bit more leading or directing than facilitating. But if there is a culture in the team where it's, you know, people are rotating and teams understand that you're kind of stepping into a facilitation mode as opposed to a decider mode. Um, it, it can work, but as a manager, or if you are a manager facilitating, I think that self-management 
becomes even more important than it normally is. How am I showing up and how am I influencing the group's outcomes and maybe what might be different if I weren't the one facilitating? Yeah, um, I like the I like the rotation that you're bringing in. I am get curious, like, without having a lot of context to that question, I'd be mm -hmm. curious, like, why do I, why do they need buy-in? And not to say that they don't, but like, that would be where I would get into is like, what are we really trying to create? What's the why behind the buy-in? Is it we're trying to get more of the team to have ownership? Um, then the question I would have is, well, maybe the way that we are facilitating needs to shift, or maybe there's something else that we need to shift in the team. So I would get, the curiosity I have is, is tell me more about the buy-in. What's the why mm -hmm. behind the buy-in and why is mm -hmm. that important? And what can we create from that with the team or the sponsor? Yeah. I love the idea of rotating facilitation. So I, there's many times where, um, especially in meetings where I'm potentially have a, a voice of decision-making that I, I want somebody else to come facilitate because uh, I want to be in, like I want to be, mm -hmm. a, I want a voice of a particular point of view, um, but I also want somebody paying attention to the full dynamic. So I think there's some places where it's nice to just step back. Yes, and once you're exposed to good facilitation, yeah. strong facilitation, you notice you when it's back. not there. Nobody, yeah. Yeah, yeah. nobody's yes. holding the space. Nobody's back. in. Yeah. Yeah, you, you become really Everyone's intolerant of meetings <laughs> where it's not there. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. That was a great um, Q and A session. Again, if your question wasn't answered, uh, we'll make sure to answer them afterwards and send out that email. I want to announce the winners of the two signed copies. Congratulations to Juki Jost and Michael Mazuelos. Um, they both won. Make sure that you stay <laughs> on and chat um, with Patty and uh, give her your uh, mailing address so we can get a book out to you. Um, Marsha, I'm going to turn it to you for one second and let yeah. you thank your panelists and then I'll have one wrap-up question. Yeah, Shannon and Mike, thank you so much. This was um, an absolute delight. I really appreciate you taking time to come and share your perspectives. It was great to to hear your thinking and just your um, stories and your lessons learned too from your own journey. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks thank for having you. us. <laughs> yeah. And for those of you uh, that are still here, we would love for you to come back tomorrow. Uh, we are going to have another session, same time. Um, tomorrow, we will be talking about leadership is a conversation, the importance of facilitating collaborative conversation. So come back tomorrow. Um, registration is the same way. If you haven't registered for tomorrow, uh, go ahead and go to that, um, that same website where you are on to come here. Um, and so I'm going to wrap it up with this this little uh, question for you. I'm going to say something and you finish my sentence. Facilitation is? I'm going to say it's a catalyst for effective collaboration and brilliance. Um, I would say facilitation is the art of being with systems and allowing their brilliance to emerge. Mm -hmm. I think those are great. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's great. Uh, yeah, and there are some people in chat are giving, let me go read them. They're oh, yeah. giving their yeah. own. Nice. Uh, facilitation is a foundation of progress. Facilitation is providing room for every voice. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. Wonderful. These are great. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, I think we yes. should make t-shirts. Yeah, <laughs> facilitation is. <laughs> we can hand them out at the virtual Agile conference this year. <laughs> exactly. Right. Excellent. Well, Shannon and Mike and Marsha, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I, it, I've learned a ton. It was great. And, I'm, and you know, looking at the Q&As that came in, um, lots of great questions. The conversation was wonderful. Um, if you have not read the book and you want to read it, Art and Science and Facilitation, Patty has shared the link several times. Uh, once again, thank you so much for being here live with this panel and asking these great questions. Um, and thank you for spending your, your hour with us. We really appreciate you. And uh, thank you, everybody. If, if you're watching this on the, on the replay, uh, make sure to connect with um, IC Agile, uh, with Shannon, with Mike, uh, with Marsha as well. Uh, everybody's on LinkedIn these days. so. 
make that connection and tell them uh, you watched them at the bookstore and um, connect connect with everybody. So we will see uh, Marsha. We will we will be back tomorrow with with another tour stop. And uh, once again, um, our thanks for uh, being yeah. here and showing up, Shannon and Mike. Yeah, thank, thank you, for you much. everybody. Thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Great day. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.